This is a test. He's the author. He's the author. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right off the right off the. Uh, the plaza is the Royal Palace of Madrid. Beautiful building. A welcome dinner that night. Nobody seemed to take a picture. And, uh, so this is where we did it. <laughs> Which, sorry folks. Um, okay, day three, Monday. We're off to the Museum de Prado. The Prado, which is one of the famous museums. On the way, I take some pictures of downtown uh, Madrid. It's Monday morning. There's traffic, but it's not bad. These, these modern buildings. We have a, a, a fountain. We have. I love these old these these buildings. I, I much prefer that building to that building. But um, this is the main railroad station in Madrid. And yes, they have high-speed rail throughout Spain. Well, you got to the Prado. The Prado is a world-class art museum in what arguably, in my view, is probably the ugliest entrance to a museum that I've ever seen. <laughs> um, but that's what it is. There are no um, pictures allowed inside, so I have, no, I have no pictures inside. If you want to do it, I think perhaps you can go to the, the Prado and get some pictures online. I don't, I don't know. But they're none of mine. We were there. Uh, we left. The, uh, we left the ho hotel probably at 8:30, 9 o'clock. We were probably there at around 10. We probably spent about two hours in the in the Prado. We had a local guide that was showing us around, and um, so it was probably 12 or 12:30 when we left the the, the uh, museum and got back in the bus and went to this hotel, the Casa de Valencia for lunch and more, and more, and here's the more. The first part was um, a video on the cooking of the Spanish specialty paella. This is Antonio, this is the owner of the restaurant, and we had a five or eight minute video on cooking. And then we turned around and lo and behold, uh, the chef came out and began to cook paella. He's got uh, his ingredients all here. He's got this burner with two rings of fire. Each, in, each are controllable. And apparently there's quite a process, a procedure, to properly cook paella. Don't ask me what the ingredients are, please. But there's the paella is cooking. And after that, we went through into the restaurant. Now, it's a beautiful restaurant. I mean, it's got white tablecloths and flowers and quite an elegant looking thing, but look, there's nobody there. And this is probably one o'clock. Well, why is that? Because lunch hour in Spain starts at two. And one of the reasons that, and so the working day starts at 10 in the morning, ends at two for lunch, commences at three, afterwards and ends at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. So dinner is like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. I see this in South America a lot. Um, but one of the reasons why goes back to World War II. Now, Spain was never invaded by Germany, never occupied by Germany, but Franco was allied, let's say, not formally, but allied with Hitler and Mussolini. So there was no need to invade Spain. It was not a problem. But they decreed, and it makes military sense, that everybody should be on the tame, same time zone. If we're going to go to battle somewhere, and we're going to go at 3 o'clock, let's make sure 3 o'clock means 3 o'clock at the same time for the entire area that Germany was influencing. Let's put it that way. At the end of the end of the uh, at the end of World War II, um, so so Spain is on the same time that Germany is with France, all of France in between. And at the end of the war, Franco said we're going to stay on the same time. So that's part of the reason why, or maybe the reason why, the whole Spanish culture is what we consider. 
later than, than we would have. So it's beautiful for us Americans. We should arrive here at one o'clock, which is lunchtime, or close, close to it, and nobody's there. We're in, we have our own private room where this is what we had. First course, the paella was around ready. That's my, that's my lunch that day, um, and a dessert. There had to be a second uh, uh, pan being made in the, in the kitchen, uh, in addition to the one that we saw being, being prepared. Uh, but it was a nice treat. And afterwards, uh, this arrived on the, on the table. Um, I'm, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing dates, I'm seeing, I think, prunes. I'm not sure what I'm seeing here and here. Sandy, do you remember? I don't know. But the, the, the liqueur here, do you remember the waiter did? <laughs> and, and, and the sad part is nobody got a picture of the waiter. You take this jug and you go. <laughs> oh, I wish somebody had made a picture. I asked and asked and asked, but never got one. Um, back, to the, back to the hotel, I did take a nap. <coughs> And I so don't have anything. But before dinner, we had a lecture on Spanish history. Um, and it was interesting, but, you know, U.S. history is like this much. European history, you know, extends <laughs> far beyond. For me, for me to recite what it was, <laughs> just, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, after the lecture, Sandy, who's with us, and Vita and myself headed to a, a restaurant that Antonio had recommended. And on the way, we passed through the Plaza Mayor, the largest plaza in all of Spain. You'll notice this evening, it's probably 8 or 9 o'clock at night, all the locals are out. This is how they socialize. This is King Philippe, this uh, statue. This horse. And on the way back, we passed the Placio Real, the royal palace, the official residence of King Philippe VI and the royal family, except they don't live there. It's used only for state ceremonies. It's a beautiful, beautiful building, and it's well lit at night. A lot of people take pictures of that, really me. Second night at the hotel. Okay, that's two nights at the hotel, so day number four, we're off and bound for uh, Cordoba with a stop for lunch at the Val, Val de Penny's wine region of the Bogotas, one of the Bogotas. Bogota is a wine shop, or in this case, a winery. And the lady that came aboard, uh, Oh, before I go, I want to talk about or mention that you find, you find these windmills. As, you, as you're driving, you look out, and they're just all over the place. They're all over the place. I doubt that they're used for electricity. I suspect they're used to pump water uh, from the ground. I think that's what probably the energy they use for. I forget that I never wrote down this lady's name. It doesn't matter, I guess. Um, the grapes were ready. There's huge vineyards as far as the eye can see. And while these things may be harvested by hand, when you get to the factory, there's a bit of a science going on here. Uh, a large winery, huge caskets, huge cask cisterns and into, into casks. And of course, here at a winery, you have a wine tasting test. You've got napkins, you've got this, this a, a cracker or something to cleanse your palate with. You've got uh, uh, the wine sample and you've got a spittoon. If you don't want to drink the wine, it's just expel it. Uh, I don't think she sold any, any wine, but she sure tried. And then down to the restaurant where the soto is served, was served for lunch. And on to Cordoba. And we crossed into Cordoba over the Roman Bridge. Now, it's, 
Roman in style, uh, and, and Roman original, the original was built in the first century BC. It's been reconstructed many times, uh, was seriously reconstructed in the eighth century. I can't imagine trying to maintain a bridge. I'll bet it's a maintenance headache. Um, but they, they make every effort to do it. And check in at our hotel. The next day, we had a, another local guide. She's right there. Uh, we started with a, with a walking tour and let lead us into the Jewish quarter. And I went and got a little information about Jewish history. And in the 10th century, uh, Cordoba uh, became the seat of Jewish learning, scholarship, and culture. Um, and the, its preeminence was undoubtedly a result of the grand achievements of one guy, whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce, who lived between 1915, uh, 915 and 970. And he's a Jew, and he served on the courts of the Muslim Caliph Abdul al-Rahman III. And between the two of them, apparently Cordoba was very prosperous, peaceful, and wish we had more of that <laughs> this time. This brass marker, I think, depicted a Jewish home. It was in the, it was in the floor, on the ground, or the pavement. And we talk about narrow streets, defining the Jewish quarter. That's a narrow street. But the reason to go to Cordoba, the overriding reason, of course, is the mosque cathedral. It is a huge structure. It's what, three blocks this way, or three blocks that way, maybe four? One, two, three, maybe four. It's huge. It's beautiful inside. And it was built initially in 784, uh, but considerably expanded by later Muslim rulers. And Cordoba returned to Christian rule in 1236 during the Reconquista. And my next slide will talk a little bit about the Reconquista. But the building itself was converted to a Roman Catholic church. This area right in here is the Roman Catholic church, which was installed right inside the mosque. If you ever get to Spain, you want to get to Cordoba to see this. Now, the Reconquista is a name that we use to describe a period of history of about 780 years. Um, and the New World, uh, okay, let's go right here. In 1491, the entire peninsula was controlled by Christian rulers. The conquest was followed by the Alhambra Decree in 1492, and we're going to do that just a little later in Alhambra, which expelled Jews who would not convert to Christianity. And a series of edicts in the years later, which forced the conversion of Muslims in Spain. And since the mid 19th century, the idea of a reconquest took hold in Spain with rising nationalism and colonialism. And at the, when I get to Portugal, I'll talk a little bit about the age of discovery, why the, the period of colonialism and nationalism was so strong. If you think about South America today, it's all Spanish or Portuguese. <coughs> Our local guide uh, has this chart. I tried to get one online, the, the chart, but I was unsuccessful. But it shows the various, uh, the initial and the various alterations and expansions of the cathedral. Uh, what I did find online was this. This was, the mesquita is the word for the, 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 the cathedral. It was originally done by Abdur Amin, I think that is pronounced, Abdur Amin the first. Expanded by Abdur Amin the second. Expanded again, good, and again, and now the, now the, the Roman Catholic Church is installed. We enter the famous cathedral. Thank you. 
This is this is me. I, I got an image without realizing I was getting my own image. This particular view is within the within the Catholic uh, Roman Catholic Church. There's some other other views, other things to see. I mean, you could. I, I've got. I think 1,400 photographs I took, not all within the building, but there's a lot of pictures that I just. function is. We leave the uh, mosquito, a little more sightseeing. Uh, it's a Roman soldier standing guard there. Um, remember this? <laughs> we were going to dinner. Uh, this was our hotel. We were going to dinner, and uh, we thought we'd better leave before the, the rains came. Well, we got as far as being across the street, and we're all lined up uh, under cover, just enough cover that we can all line up uh, and the rains did not stop for about half an hour uh, or more, and we wound up, uh, Antonio somehow got, got a taxi for us, for all of us. How we did that, I don't know. So we went to the, the restaurant Bodegas Mesquita, and uh, nobody took a picture there. Second night at Cordoba, and then the third, day six, now we're back on the road, headed for Seville with a stop in Granada. And why in Granada? because of the Alhambra Fortress. You've been there, right? Yeah, you've been there. There it is. Originally constructed in, 18, in 889 AD on the remains of Roman fortif fortifications. Um, at the conclusion of the Christian Reconquista in 1492, the site became the royal court of Ferdinand and Isabella where Christopher Columbus went to receive his royal endorsement for his expedition, and thank goodness he did. Our local guide, um, you know, normally a guide has a staff and a, and a flag up there that it signifies, well, this guy was seven feet something. <laughs> you did not need a flag. You find him anywhere. Um, and he was very, very good at job. And he started with a tour through the gardens and he, he made a, a point that I had never heard before, that if you were Muslim and you lived in the desert, what would you think paradise would look like? Well, it would have water, wouldn't it? It would have, it would have water and it would have bubbling water, if you will, and it would have flowers and it would be beautiful, wouldn't it? That's what it would look like. So we go, uh, this is Alhambra from the gardens, uh, built on some of the rope, Roman remains, we enter the Alhambra palace itself, where we don't spend too much time in it. But inside, within the palace, again, you, you revert to the, to the water, 
to the to the hedges which is which are which are, which are trimmed to perfection uh, the arches that are reflected in the mirrors even inside you have a you have a water fountain and you have these little this little channel so that you can do some planting or something right here with flowers this is what paradise looked like we went into one large room where uh, I wish I had framed this a little better but you have this panel and if you'll notice this part of it is the same as this part of it it says according to some interpretation uh, only God attains victory uh, when when my wife looked at this she says God she says wouldn't it say only Allah <laughs> attains victory uh, I don't know whether you know what interpretation you want to make from that uh, but it's repeated twice in each panel and then repeated hundreds of times in well, in other places within the wall and this is a fairly large room this is, it's not as big as this room probably half the size of this room but at least taller than this for sure Uh, there's a couple of pictures I have here. This is uh, this is a view of a ceiling, painted ceiling. So, uh, and it, it, and you have artwork on the on the wall. And there's one place where you get a view of the city from the uh, Alhambra. And this is the is remains of the old walls that define the city. We went to the palace of Charles V. Sorry about my fingers in here. Now I walked along the upper upper walkway here and looked in the windows and it was it's the offices of this of the city this is where city government is has their offices they were computers and desks and people doing whatever they do so it's it's, it's a working plant place uh sandy provided this film for uh film. i love the juxtaposition of the image that you see reflected in this modern building with the building across the street and i ask which building would you prefer to explore and then I thought to think about it, which, which building would I rather work in? And the answer would be this one. Four reasons. One, they're probably air conditioned. Hey, there's probably an elevator in there. And three, you've got a great view. So, you know, I would like to explore this one, the one across the street. But I think if I were working there, I'd like to work in that one. If I had a, if I had a window office, you know. Um, then on to our hotel. Now, this is one big hotel, folks. I've never been to a hotel that had like eight or ten elevators. And you don't present yourself. You, you present yourself to a panel and you punch in your room number and it will tell you which elevator you go to. And I'm sure there's a computer there, you know, maximizing the efficiency of... So, uh, I, and I tried to find out, I tried to find online and find out how many rooms we have in this hotel. And I couldn't, the hotel didn't tell me. Um, maybe you could find it through some travel agent or something, I don't know. But. I was kind of interested because that's a big hotel. And they served us dinner. And they all, all the breakfasts were served in the hotels. And th th this is not untypical. This is very typical of what you get anywhere. And uh, Sandy, <laughs> Sandy, this is yours. And my question to you is, this was like coffee or, or this was juice? This was like yogurt? This was like a piece of... Uh, that looks like pineapple. That looks like orange. Pastry. Is is this a sticky bun? Yeah. Did you eat the whole thing? <laughs> oh, I'm glad she's here. <laughs> Off to the Cathedral of the Saint Mary of the Sea. Um, it's a new structure. Well, new structure. I don't have a date on it. Uh, what I can tell you is the bell tower used to be a minaret. This was built on the site of a mosque. This is a converted minaret. So we went into the cathedral. It took us a while to get in with all the groups that were lined up. 
and our guide is doing her thing. Inside is the casket of Christopher Columbus. It's quite an elegant thing, as you can see. You've got these four, uh, I don't know what to call them. Uh, this picture is an attempt to get at what's under, the, under here. It's not uh, that successful. Uh, there's Christopher. Interior views of the Cathedral of Seville and a very high ceiling structure. And I climbed the minaret. I didn't know if I wanted to take on the minaret, you know. <laughs> I'm not as young as I used to be. But yes, I did. Uh, I was successful up there. And the answer is it's not a series of steps. It's a series of ramps. The, the, it's essentially a square. And so you have, you have a, a ramp up, a landing, a ramp up, a landing, a ramp all the way around like that. And the ramp is ribbed, what I refer to as ribbed. So you can take whatever st step you're comfortable with. And yeah, I got up there. And the minute I put my foot on the very last up there, what happened? A bell rang. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it was so timely. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I remember that. Sandy remembers that. So my question here, my, my, my thing stopped. No. Well, what do you see? I'm sorry. I don't, that's not working anymore. What do you see in the, in the, in the background there to the right? What do you see? This, this, this thing like, like this. What is it? Well, what do they do in Spain? Bullfights. I think so. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's the bullfighting, right? Yeah. I don't know what that is. No clue. But look how jumbled it is. Uh, the city is. I mean, uh, the streets don't go left, you know, east to west, north and south by any means. They're, uh, they're jumbled. And then we went to uh, what I've referred to as a famous architectural oddity, the Metropole Parasol. There's a couple of views. This is a totally wooden structure well, I'm sure there's some concrete base, but the actual structure is all wood. What you see is all wood. Um, a German architect. It's at four levels. The underground level is the uh, antiquity area where Roman and Moorish remains are displayed. Level one, street level, is a market. The roof of level one, which is where this picture is taken, uh, is an open air public plaza. And then there are two levels above. You enter through a doorway in the, what I call the stem of that. Um, and offers, there's two restaurants. And uh, these are only the only photographs that we took. But I went online because I thought I wanted to, to show the, the magnitude of this structure, an aerial view. And there you have it. I refer to this as urban renewal run amok. I mean, it does, just doesn't fit <laughs> in the territory here. And I don't know, of course, you don't see these walkways, if that's what they are, from ground level. I think there's probably a restaurant in the, the middle right one there, and that you could walk down and back up and back down and around, and I think that's what that is. The Metropole. Dinner that night at Bodega Siglo and why it's number 18, I don't know. That's their address. And we had dinner and a flamingo show. And I'm sitting in the wrong spot to photograph this. Of all the places I could sit. Oh, 
Laura, she can go up, pick her up, she's behind the lace. <laughs> And that's her finale. Back to the hotel. Oop, we're stuck. Day eight, back on the road uh, from Seville to Faro with a stop for lunch at a producer of wine. Surprise, surprise. But first, a tour of the grounds by a train, which I refer to as a Disney-like experience. It wasn't as pleasant a ride as it could have been on cobblestones. I will tell you that right now. It, this, they don't have a lot of springs in, in, in there. It's a sherry, and the lineup on the top left here is the various shades that sherry changes according to how long it's been bottled in time. And we went into multiple buildings, and all you really saw was these casks. Um, and, and I just, had, uh, just took a couple of pictures of, there's one for Lana Turner, in Hollywood, and I don't know what, you read the date, it looks like, I can't read it here either, it looks like it might be 33 or something. Lana's long gone, so I don't know what's going to happen to that. Uh, Steven Silberg, there were, there were hundreds of others. And of course, we were there for dinner, or lunch, and this was the lunch that was served. A little different lunch than we've had other ones. It was fine. And on the road to Faro, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the roads, the transportation. Very good roads. And what uh, interstate quality, uh, I think we drove all the way and usually when there was, you know, it was, it was like a, a bridge, so you, you, you didn't have any stops on the, on the main highways. It, almost interstate quality. And what they always had uh, were, were guardrails. Their, their, guard, their dual guardrails, there's real guardrails on both sides, and this would, this would go a long way to stop and this occasional thing that happens is that people lose control or wind up going the wrong way on, and with sometimes very, very difficult results. Um, so the median gets the uh, planning on one side and a double guardrail on the other. And we get to Faro, and Faro is in Portugal. We went, the, there was no customs or pass through. The bus was just waved right on through the border. Yes, there was a border there, and yes, there were you know, guards there, but uh, they see the bus, and I guess it's saying, oh, sure, lifelong learning is the truth, running across the top. Uh, so right on through, you know, we had our passports out in case they wanted them, but no. Uh, this was our hotel. Um, it had a nice view at the very top, um, at, uh, and, the, and the food service was up there. But as I noted, uh, the, the view was spectacular, and so were the so were the prices. So we said, nope, no, thank you. Uh, we did do an exploring of Faro. Faro is a little fishing community. It's not that big, but it has some Roman remains, and it has one of the uh, remains uh, and one of the interesting and very exquisite small feral cathedral with these views in it. Uh, for, for a tiny little fishing village, uh, it, it's hard to understand how they ma ever managed to uh, acquire this type of uh, thing. Uh, dinner at an outdoor restaurant, and again, uh, the photos that I was looking for, nobody seemed to have. But I did take one of, so whoever ordered steak, that's quite a helping of steak, I would say. Steak and fries? Yeah. So what do you have, Sandy? I have seafood. Sea, seafood? Yeah, and it came with the shells. Shells, shells, all in I did go get a, a stock photo from the, uh, up at the top of the, of the hotel. And uh, on day nine now, uh, we depart Faro for Lisbon with a stop at the town of Elvora. Um, 
And why is it a World Heritage Site? Well, because uh, roots go back to Roman time, and it was a residence of the Portuguese kings. And it has these, a lot of these whitewashed houses decorated with, somebody will have to pronounce that for me, and wrought iron balconies dated from the 16th and 18th centuries. The appetizers. Again, you'll see we're there at one o'clock or so, and there's nobody else in for lunch. But in Portugal, they said the appetizers cost extra, right? I mean, it's included in our check, but no. what it is, it's not the appetizers, it's bread, it's the and the bacon. It was served uh, for more or less family style. Was less, uh, you, you took what you wanted from what was in front of it uh, on the table. Uh, on the way to Lisbon, we, we passed under a functioning aqueduct. Uh, enter the, enter, cross the bay and enter Lisbon. And uh, a quick view of historic Aquas Libras aqueduct. Construction started in 1731, finished 1736, 35 arches, about a thousand feet. That's like 10 football fields lined up to get from one side of the valley to the other. It's a functioning aqueduct. We check into our hotel, check right back out on the bus and go to the Geronimos Monastery along with 10,000 of our closest friends. Uh, it's full of tourists today. I guess many days it is. Where uh, we discover the, the Vasco da Gama's resting place. Now, what's Vasco da Gama famous for? Rounding Africa. Pardon? Rounding Africa. Rounding Africa. Yes, he first opened the sailing route to India. Yeah. He was the first to prove that you could sail from Spain to India if you went far enough south around the Cape of Good Hope. And the Lamb Tower, I believe is how it's pronounced, or the Tower of St. Vincent, again another UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the role it played in the Age of Discovery. So let me talk a little bit about the Age of Discovery. You have Portuguese and Spanish you have Vasco da Gama, you have Ferdinand Magellan. The world is no longer flat. The world is round. Magellan has sailed around the world. Magellan, Magellan didn't, didn't survive the full trip, but his navigators did. Uh, so he was the first to prove that, yes, you could sail around the world. And, and it was an age of time when uh, expansion into South America and Central America. You think about the Caribbean, you think about uh, South America. And, uh, here's a question for you. What country speaks Portuguese in South America? Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, that's their national language. So the Portuguese were, would be to be Portuguese or to be Spanish at that time frame, it was something to be proud of. They were, they were very nationalistic. Uh, went to dinner with Andrea. Andrea, where are you? There she is, in back. Remember that? Oh yeah, she's shaking her head. Yeah. And how are you? How are your kids? Everything good? All good. Yeah. Good. Overnight at there. Uh, Monday. This is day ten. We went to the. We left the hotel. Uh, got on to, to, to drive to the Campania des Lazarias, I believe you pronounce it. Again, it's a winery. You think we would have a wine tour of Spain. Well, we did. <laughs> uh, but they also, uh, this was a huge uh, government-run operation. It was uh, expropriated during the World War II uh, and never returned to its owners. I don't know the full story about that. I think I might have heard it, but it didn't stay with me. Um, and they do winery. And if you want to try it the old-fashioned way, 
<laughs> you were welcome to do that, take your shoes off or whatever, <laughs> climb right in. Uh, but the rest of it was, uh, they do the full thing, they do the bottling, they do the packaging, they do the thing. Uh, so we're in Portugal, and question for you, what is Portugal most famous for? Cork. I heard cork. Yeah. So let's talk about cork. Cork is, is, cut, is harvested from trees. When I say harvested, the trees are not cut down. It's a very sustainable agricultural operation. It's, they've been harvested from these trees. You'll note there's a number on the tree, and that indicates the year that it was last harvested because you can't harvest a tree again for another six or eight years. I'm not sure what it's, six or eight, something like that. And you can't harvest the first harvest until the tree is 40 years old. And these trees will live for hundreds of years. The older they get, the less productive, just like us. So their cork trees are all over the place. So no tree is cut down. So it's very sustainable. And the agricultural workers, among the highest paid, and they're not paid by weight or volume. Because the concern is their, their first responsibility is to the health of the trees. So they need to, they, they, work, in, they work in pairs. They're called triadors, I guess is how you pronounce that. One up the tree and one on the ground, and they take off these huge por portions of, of bark, and it apparently peels like an orange. And initially, it, it, the tree is, is bright yellow. The living layer of bark is bright yellow. And it takes, it reddens in a day or two, um, and then we'll uh, with time pass, the bark will thicken and darken again, and eight years or six years later, you can harvest it again. But the, the, the paler color will redden like that. So that tree has just been harvested a day or two earlier, or three days, what, you know, very frequent, uh, very recent harvesting. And then as they age, they take on this color. And efforts, they make every effort to protect brand new trees with a wire cage so that they aren't trampled by wildlife. Also, uh, back on the bus, uh, they do quite a bit of work with cattle. They have horses, including the stables. Uh, they do rice patties, which I didn't take a picture of. Uh, and then we return to Lisbon and the afternoon shopping. This is our, our last day, or next to last day there. So the afternoon is a, a shopping trip because there were, Sandy, there was no time during this whole thing other than maybe this day to do shopping. And some of these products on the right uh, are cork. I don't know that all of them are, but uh, there's a, certainly a lot of cork. And yes, I bought some. And day 10, we have a farewell dinner. Antonio leads us across the street to the Alitejo, I guess is how you pronounce that, in Provo. And this is one elegant place. <laughs> This is not the dining room we used, but it, the dining room we did use was just about the same quality. Beautiful dining room. Uh, plenty of excellent food and drink at the most elaborate venue that I have been in a long time. In fact, maybe ever. That's my dinner. I took, had eaten most of my appetizer by the time I remembered to take a, take a picture of it. And that was duck. That was the best duck I think I ever had. Oh, was that good. They know how to cook duck there. A dessert pudding. Overnight at, uh, our, at our hotel again, second night. 
and back to uh, back to the Delta Airlines and a plane home. And when we got to Berlin, uh, when we got to JFK, uh, our flight to Burlington was a problem. We boarded at time on time. I think we boarded at 9:25 or something like that. We go out to the uh, taxi out, and we sit there for an hour and 40 minutes. And I learned that FAA requires, if you're sitting there for an hour and 40 minutes, they must return you to the terminal and deplane you, which they did. And probably 45 minutes or an hour later, we reboarded to go back out and sit for another half hour. And the reason for this was there was lightning strikes in the area. There was rain and lightning strikes. JFK has a lot of big planes that are going to Europe and they can't sit there on the tarmac burning fuel. They need to get airborne. Their priority exceeds a trip to Burlington, Vermont. But you've got to get a plane to Burlington, Vermont, because there's people the next morning looking for that plane in Burlington to go wherever it is. So uh, I, I got into bed at 4.30 a.m. But I survived it, I guess. Gracias y adiós. Thank you much. <laughs>